sorry for the technical difficulties. We don't normally do webinars, and so it's a little bit out of the norm. Take it away, Brittany. Well, thank you everyone for being here on this particularly cold Earth Day. Um, to learn more about spotted lanternfly identification, reporting, and to a lesser extent, removal. Uh, my name is Brittany Legale. I'm a member of Danvey's uh, Conservation Advisory Council and a terrestrial plant specialist at Finger Lakes Partnership for Regional Invasive Species Management, which is housed within the Finger Lakes Institute at Hobart and William Smith Colleges in Geneva. So I thought we'd get started by just defining what invasive species are, since there seems to be some confusion about that in the general public. Um, so invasive species are always non-native species. Um, native species that have become overpopulated generally do so because um, controls of their population have generally been uh, removed due to anthropogenic disturbance. So an example of that would be uh, white-tailed deer overpopulation and the removal of wolves. Um, but invasive species are invasive because They've not evolved within the context of our ecosystems and our native species. So they generally don't have any natural pests or uh, pathogen, uh, pathogens that cause disease. So um, not all non-native species are invasive, of course. Um, to be considered invasive, a species must have shown to do economic harm, environmental harm, or harm to human health. So here we have some examples. Um, on the far left, you can see uh, someone who has suffered a chemical burn due to giant hogweed. Uh, the center picture shows someone who's or, uh, an outbuilding that's been consumed by kudzu. And then on the far right, we can see massive hemlock die-off due to hemlock oleodeldrin as a, an example of environmental harm. Um, how do invasive species get here? Uh, the short answer is human activity. About 56% of terrestrial invasive plants uh, came courtesy of the landscaping industry. Um, landscaping, uh, the landscaping industry generally likes plants that have very hardy root systems that don't suffer from pests or diseases and that have profuse flowers or fruits. Uh, meaning also seeds. So you can imagine how that plays into um, a species becoming invasive. Um, a few came as food crops. Uh, an example would be garlic mustard, which was brought by early colonists as a um, early spring crop. Uh, the pet and aquarium trade is responsible for a lot of the uh, aquatic invasives because people tend to get tired of their aquariums and dump them into natural waterways. So that's how hydrilla become, became widespread in North America. And then um, many of our aquatic invasives came as stowaways in the ballast water of cargo ships. So when a cargo ship is leaving port, they take up a bunch of water in the hull to balance the weight of the cargo. And then they release that water when they get to their destination port. And that water often contains um, aquatic invasives like quagga mussel, zebra mussel, um, or eggs or plant propagules. Um, and then also uh, many invasives get here as hitchhikers on globally traded products, such as quarry stone, uh, plant materials such as lumber, landscaping plants, wood pallets, and packing material. And then as you can see on this map, New York has more invasive forest pests than any other state. And this is uh, due to two reasons. One is our very active ports, and another is um, the wide range of ecosystems we have, as well as our uh, high biodiversity, meaning that once the species gets here, it can likely find a place to proliferate and a host species. Um, so now let's move on to spotted lanternfly in particular. Um, it's not actually a fly, it's a plant hopper that's native to China and Southeast Asia. Um, it's a recent arrival, having uh, first been detected in Berks County, Pennsylvania in 2014. 
is thought to have been brought in as egg masses on quarried stone from China. Um, since 2014, it has spread to 34 counties in Pennsylvania, including eight counties that were added to the quarantine zone in 2021. And it has also spread to New York, mainly downstate, um, and Tompkins County, of course, um, New Jersey, Maryland, Delaware, Virginia, and then as of this year, one county in West Virginia, Connecticut, and Ohio. Uh, so it's spreading pretty rapidly. Um, spotted lanternfly as a leaf hopper has piercing mouth parts that are able to insert themselves into the sugary veins of plants. Those of you familiar with plant anatomy will know this as phloem. So those are the transport veins that take the sugary byproducts of photosynthesis from the leaves and distribute them throughout the plant. Uh, they are known to feed on over 70 plant species, which makes them very hard to control. They have a preference for Alianthus altissima, tree of heaven, which is an invasive from their native range. They actually take up a toxin from tree of heaven that makes them unpalatable to birds that might eat them. And they tend to spend uh, much of their life cycle on the tree of heaven, moving off primarily during the egg laying season. Um, so there in the middle, you can see tree of heaven in bloom, or uh, going to seed rather. It resembles sumac. So I put the picture of it going to seed in here because that's the easiest time to di differentiate it from sumac. Um, if you break the branches, it has a slight odor of rancid peanut butter. So that's another way to tell, um, to differentiate it from sumac. But um, when it goes to seed, you can really tell. It has these uh, yellow to pink uh, seed heads. Um, on the left there, you can see the nymphal stage of spotted lanternfly crawling up uh, young uh, Alanthus. And then on the right, you can see adult spotted lanternflies crawling up uh, native grape. So while they do prefer Tree of Heaven, they don't need it to complete their life cycle. And they're also highly attracted to grapes, hops, apples, maples, particularly silver maple and red maple, uh, walnuts, including black walnut, oaks, pines, sumac, and several others, uh, sycamore, birch, um, lot, lots of other host species. So, Unfortunately, spotted lanternfly tends to swarm in the tens of thousands. So on the lower left there, you can see a swarm of spotted lanternfly covering a maple tree uh, near someone's house. Um, while they won't kill a mature tree, they cause stress. So that can make mature trees susceptible to secondary pests and diseases. Um, but they can and do kill grapevines, which has particular significance for the Finger Lakes, of course, and um, newly planted trees. There's also uh, some concern that they might affect um, forest regeneration uh, because of this honeydew rain that they produce, which uh, coats lower leaves, making them unable to uh, photosynthesize. So, the honeydew rain is a sugary excrement that they uh, excrete out their back ends. Um, they tend to congregate higher in a tree and feed. So it comes down as a thick rain because of this um, swarming habit that they also have. And um, in addition to coating leaves, uh, it attracts black sooty molds. Um, which uh, combine to negatively impact the plant growth and fruit production. And the um, black city molds also ruin fruit for human consumption. So in the center there, you can see a swarm of spotted lanternfly on an apple tree. And we haven't really seen huge losses from uh, apples like we thought we would, uh, but they, ha they have uh, hugely impacted grapes. And then on the right there, you can see sap oozing down a young tree and the uh, black sooty mold starting to cover some leaves. 
So they're a particular threat to the Finger Lakes because of our vibrant wine industry and the tourist industry that um, is um, secondary to that. Um, again, we haven't really seen in North America our apples suffer greatly like, uh, like they have in South Korea, and we don't really know why that is. Um, but in addition to the wine industry, we're worried about uh, implications for the nursery industry um, because if this uh, insect becomes widespread, while they probably won't kill off nursery stock, um, the nurseries will be subject to quarantine restrictions, which will make doing business uh, a lot more costly. Same with uh, forestry. While we don't see the spotted lanternfly killing off forest uh, trees, um, the timber industry would then be subjected to um, costly regulation. Um, and then perhaps uh, most significantly for those of us who live in the Finger Lakes, um, the honeydew rain uh, both damages property and lowers property values and makes outdoor recreation uh, a lot less enjoyable. Um, here in the uh, lower right hand corner, you can see uh, someone's stoop, which they have power washed that bottom step. And then on the other two, you can see the honeydew rain and the uh, black sooty mold that's taken over. Um, I've also seen pictures of people's fireplaces that are just completely full of spotted lanternfly uh, because they do tend to migrate up as adults and then fall into fireplaces, but they don't um, cause structural damage to houses. Um, as far as uh, vineyards, they've been very lethal to grape plants or to grapevines. Um, I've seen studies where they caused 90% yield reduction uh, in one vineyard. And in another vineyard, they killed 40 acres of planted vines. So we're very, very concerned about the effect on the wine industry and the tourist industry that the wine industry brings to the Finger Lakes. <clears throat> So now we'll talk a little bit about how to identify a spotted lanternfly. Um, as a true insect, they have a complicated life cycle, um, starting as these egg masses that are laid on trees and other objects. Uh, they then progress through four nymphal, what we call instar stages. The first three, they're uh, black with white spots. The fourth uh, instar is uh, black with white spots and red patches, and they're a little bit bigger. And then the adult is probably the um, version we're all familiar with, with these um, pink, uh, pinkish tan wings with black spots. So now we'll go through each of these life stages. <clears throat> so um, the egg masses are present. They began to be deposited in September, and then they're present through the fall of June, typically. Um, the first through third in stars begin to emerge around April and are present through July. And then the uh, third or the fourth end star, the uh, red, white, and black uh, beetle-like bug is uh, present from July through September. And adults, typically the earliest we see them is July. And then they persist until the second or third frost kills them off in December. So egg masses are deposited in the fall. Um, but they're not just laid on the host plants. Um, spotted lanternfly famously will lay their eggs on anything that's not moving. Um, they, in addition to bark, they really like stone, concrete, plastic, and metal. And they have a special affinity for rusty metal, which has implications for um, spotted lanternfly movement and dispersal uh, in this part of the country. Of course, we use a lot of salt uh, to clear our roads of ice in the winter, which causes rust under cars and probably the way that they got to Ithaca and a lot of other places is from egg masses being deposited on the rusty undersides of vehicles. So when they're first deposited, egg masses are bright white, very easy to identify. Uh, on the uh, right-hand side there, you can see newly deposited egg mass. 
Um, and un just under that, you can see an older one that's darker gray. Um, so they tend to turn a grayish brown as they age. Um, and that waxy mud-like substance that they're covered in uh, will begin to crack. Um, on the right-hand side, you can see the parallel uh, lines of eggs um, that adult was probably startled and moved away before it could uh, cover those eggs with the uh, mud-like substance. Um, so uh, that's typically what you'll find. So some survey tips if you're out looking for egg masses. They're much easier to see on sunny days than overcast days. Um, good places to look are on the outside of bark as well as exposed undersides of bark. They tend to like to lay their eggs in sheltered areas. So cankers, holes in trees are great places to look. Um, as I mentioned, they also like to lay their eggs on stone and concrete. Uh, rusty metal, any kind of metal, but they really like rusty metal and plastic surfaces. So um, playgrounds, outdoor plastic equipment, things like that. So if you find an egg mass, um, take pictures and email Ag and Markets, and we'll give you the specifics on that a little later. And then um, you'll want to scrape the egg masses off into a baggie or container uh, with some hand sanitizer in it to kill the eggs. So here are some pictures of egg masses uh, from Pennsylvania. Uh, there you can see a rusty drum with about three dozen egg masses on it. Um, and then on the right, an old rusty tire. And uh, you can see that they've laid the eggs both on the rusty part as well as the rubber. They're fairly indiscriminate. Then here on the uh, far left, you can see a garden tool with a couple egg masses on it. Uh, in the middle of there, you can see a railroad tie with uh, an egg mass. Railroads have been um, highly implicated in the movement of spotted lanternfly from different counties and states. And then on the far right there, uh, this is probably the um, the thing that gets confused with spotted lanternfly egg masses the most, uh, the gypsy moth egg mass, um, which you'll find uh, very numerous this year. We had a bumper crop of invasive gypsy moth last year. Uh, but if you scrape that light tan egg sac, you'll see that it's very woolly, hairy. Whereas the spotted lanternfly uh, egg mass is um, very like crusty and hard. Um, so that's a good way to tell the difference. So that's the, the gypsy moth egg mass on the top and just under that and to the right is the spotted lanternfly egg mass. So the first through third instars, nymphal stages of spotted lanternfly um, appear beetle-like. Uh, some people will mistake them for ticks. I assume that's people that don't have much experience with ticks, but uh, we do get that. Um, so they're all black with white spots. They're about a quarter inch long, and you'll be able to find them April through July. They're quite shy and good at hiding. They're very fast, so they're the least detectable of all the life stages of spotted lanternfly. So on the bottom left there, you can see a couple um, uh, early instars on a grapevine. And then on the right, you can see uh, many instars hatching from an egg mass. So this is the fourth instar uh, next to a uh, third instar on the uh, bottom left for size comparison. They're about three quarter inches long. Um, they're quite conspicuous with those big red patches, and they will be present from July through September. You'll notice that none of the nipple stages have wings. They're very beetle-like in appearance. So this is the adult, probably the uh, images we're most uh, familiar with. 
Um, again, they're not a true fly, they're a leaf hopper. So they don't really tend to fly. You'll mostly see them with their wings folded back. Um, they're subject to short bursts of light around like September when they, they begin laying eggs and disperse a little bit wider. Um, but otherwise they only fly when they're startled. Um, they're about one inch long. They have these pinkish tan wings with uh, black spots and a hatched pattern near the tip. And then when they do fly, you can see those bright red uh, underwings. Um, the abdomens are black <clears throat> with yellow stripes and uh, pregnant females will have swollen abdomens and they will be present from July through December. So another way to identify spotted lanternfly is through the damage that they do. So uh, telltale signs are oozing sap coming off of trees or vines, which you can see illustrated in the bottom right hand corner there. Um, the sooty black mold either at the base of the trees or on the leaves. Um, so in the top right hand corner, you can see a, uh, looks like a grape leaf that's covered in black sooty mold. And then uh, you'll also be able to find the uh, black sooty mold coating um, property or bark, basically anywhere that the honeydew rain can reach. Um, and then that sticky honeydew rain, of course, is another indicator. Although if you're dealing with that, you can probably see quite a few adults as well. So to, re to report spotted lantern fly, um, you'll wanna take a picture of either insect, egg mass, or signs of infestation. Um, if you can, include something for scale, like a coin or a ruler. Note the location. This can be an address, landmarks, GPS coordinate, coordinates, intersecting roads, anything that can identify the spot. Um, and then you'll want to email all that information to the New York Department of Ag and Markets, spotted lanternfly at agriculture, .newyork.gov. So you can also report to IMAP Invasives, which is a great citizen science tool if you haven't heard of it yet. Um, it's an excellent reporting device, especially for new invasives that are high priority because they haven't um, been widely dispersed yet, like hydrilla um, or spotted lanternfly. Uh, so if you wanna look into that, I would highly encourage you to do so. It's a great tool for um, early detection, rapid response management. And then finally, um, one thing you can do is be sure you don't move spotted lanternfly uh, by familiarizing yourself with where the populations occur um, and avoiding those areas, or if you can't avoid those areas, um, <clears throat> maybe uh, be on alert, um, especially September through December when adults are laying eggs. Um, and then if you are visiting a quarantined area, be sure to check your vehicle and any recreational gear or equipment that you have for egg masses or adults. Um, and don't transport plant material or firewood, or I would say stones as well, um, from areas where spotted lantern flies tend to occur. Um, and I think, yeah, that's all I have. So if there are any questions. Wow, that was impressive. Uh, could you address the, what, what, what do we know about control? So not a whole lot, unfortunately. Um, all that's um, still under research and development. I know Cornell is working with a couple native uh, fungal pathogens that seem to infect spotted lanternfly, but those studies are still in their infancy. Um, as far as um, control for vineyards, mm -hmm. uh, the latest advice is to treat um, border areas around the vineyards because they don't fly. They tend to go high up in a tree and then drop on the uh, vines on the borders of the vineyards. So um, by spraying those trees or injecting them with a systemic pesticide like dinotefuron, um, the the spotted lanternfly will ingest the pesticide when it's feeding on the tree and then die off. Um, but mainly the vineyards right now are spraying um, with the uh, systemic pesticide 
I know they have to use about three times as much as they normally do, which of course increases the cost of production and the amount of pesticide that's getting on the fruit. Um, mm. But uh, the spotted lanternfly is actually susceptible to pesticide. The problem is they hatch in such great numbers and for such a long time frame, like every three weeks for three months, that it's just a constant onslaught. And every time you kill what's on your crops, they just move in from the outside. So um, right now it's just costly and, and a lot of pesticide. Oh, another thing you can do is um, if you have Tree of Heaven on your property, you can monitor it because they'll probably go there first. And um, you can ingest or inject the Tree of Heaven with Dinoceptron to kill off any spotted lantern fly that might feed on it. But those are the recommendations so far. We are hopeful that the fungal pathogens that Cornell's developing will eventually be a suitable biocontrol. Yeah, Atlantis is marginally hardy here. Yeah, um, and that's uh, another good point is that uh, you shouldn't cut Atlantis down because it will sucker from the roots. Of, like a hydro plant, like you'll have a, a million of them if you try to do that. The most effective way to kill it is uh, the basil bark method where you hack into it, create a wound, and then spray um, an herbicide, a systemic herbicide like glyphosate or trichlor into the wound during the growing season. So they don't kill the, they don't kill the Atlantis themselves? No, unfortunately they don't. <laughs> It could have been a it could have been a control for Atlantis, but not such luck. <laughs> um, are there any other questions? This guy see uh, something in the chat. What can you do to stop infestation on your property, if anything? So I think we just covered that a little bit. Um, there's not really a silver bullet right now. Again, the because they just arrived here in 2014, the uh, research and developments in its infancy. But um, I'd say if you want to prevent their establishment, um, using that basal bark method to kill any tree of heaven that might be on your property is a good route to go. Um, otherwise, monitoring um, the tree of heaven to see you know, if, if any might arrive on your property. Uh, yeah, that's that's about it for now. They might be susceptible to um, some of the organic uh, herbicide oils, but I haven't seen any studies on that yet. They're, they, li they're not like a delicate insect though. It's just that they, they reproduce in such high numbers that they're an issue. I suspect that that buzzing we were hearing is an indication that the webinar is about to end because I think we have a 40 minute window before we get um, cut off. Okay. I'm glad I squeezed it in then. <laughs> yeah. um, so we could keep going until it, so we suddenly disappear. Um, can you tell us, can you spell out the name of the, the pesticide that you mentioned? Oh, Dino Tefuron. <laughs> um, <laughs> let's see if I can. Uh, I'll probably need to look it up in just a second. Um, it's um, a systemic pesticide that's also used for hemlock woolly adelgid. Oh. It's D-I-N-O-T-E-F-U-R-A-N. And so that's, if you wanted to inject that into um, a likely host tree, mm -hmm. uh, that would kill any spotted lanternfly that land on the tree. And because... Uh, Tree of Heaven is also an invasive. It doesn't have any native poll pollinators. So uh, what they're seeing is just massive die off of spotted lanternfly under the canopies of treated Tree of Heaven and not a lot of non-target uh, insect loss. So that that's controlled a uh, pesticide that you would have to have a license to use? Or? I believe in New York, yes. So it's not an option for your amateur homeowners. <laughs> Yeah, um, I would say the most important thing you can do because the local population isn't very widespread. 
I've done surveys um, on behalf of Ag and Markets of all the city parks in Ithaca, and I didn't find any egg masses or signs of infestation anywhere except for the small area of the Fall Creek neighborhood where they first detected the population. So I'd say the best thing you can do now is just keep an eye on your property when you're hiking, um, anytime you're outside and it's a sunny day, um, just look for the egg masses and report anything that you see um, because so far we're doing a good job of camping down. Is Fall Creek the only place that's been seen in Tompkins County? Yes. Yeah, and it was just uh, November of last year. Mm -hmm. So if we can, you know, unfortunately, um, it's an insect that's very easily spread through human activity. So there is an element of, you know, it's just a matter of time. But the best thing that we can do, especially until uh, adequate control methods are developed, is to keep populations from becoming widespread in our area and in the Finger Lakes in general. Okay. I don't see any other questions. This was uh, amazing. <laughs> well, I'm glad you enjoyed it. <laughs> I hope we don't have to deal with it in this kind of scale of the pictures you were showing. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of horrifying. If you uh, if you Google it or uh, go to YouTube and look for videos of like spotted lanternfly swarms. It's pretty intimidating the amount of honeydew rain they produce and just the damage that they can do to property. And the um, so, too. Oh, sorry, what was that? And the swarms are pretty impressive too. Yeah, yeah, tens of thousands. It's, it's crazy. <laughs> but you know, we had uh, we had the same problem with gypsy moth when it first arrived. We thought it would be like the end of our forests on the east coast, and then. Eventually, as native um, birds and um, other predators and pathogens w became exposed to it, um, those populations started to dwindle. So there is some hope because it's still so early that hopefully some native um, uh, pathogen or predator will begin to, <laughs> to eat the spotted lanternfly or infect it, and that'll help keep the population under control. The gypsy moth has seen a bit of a resurgence here in the last year or two. Yeah, yeah, we're having a uh, a boom year. They they're expecting it to be even worse this year than than the last. But we do have birds that that eat them and funguses that infect them at this point. So could could be worse. <laughs> it was pretty bad in the northern part of the Finger Lakes last year. Yeah, I'm finding them all over my trees uh, down here in Danby. Yeah, me too. They haven't hatched yet, though. I'm hoping that the, if they're close to hatching, which they ought to be, I would think. I want, Are they more susceptible, you think, to that 16 degrees we had last night here? I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful that the black flies that just started coming out uh, got knocked back a little bit by that, too. <laughs> Let's see. Okay, well, thank you. Um, and that's what I'm hearing. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> well, thank um, you everyone for being here and for uh, taking the first step and uh, helping keep this nasty pest out of our uh, out of our beautiful Finger Lakes. Thank you, Brittany. <laughs>